between dips in the sea, examine his legacy to contemporary travel writing. The story begins here, in Corfu. Durrell arrived in Corfu in the spring of 1935, just 24, with his wife of six weeks. He was a young poet, escaping what he called Pudding Island, with its arid and vapid literature. Greece then was not, in all but a geographic sense, part of Europe. It was foreign, far away from pork sausages and Bloomsbury, and these Greek islands especially were places apart. Durrell chose to live on them to be, quote, remote from the responsibilities of an active life in Europe. And that's the key. For here, in an enclosed little world surrounded by the sea, he could nurture his creativity. There was sun, swimming, sex, and it was cheap. It's hard for us to understand, I think, now quite how Greece was in the 1930s, says travel writer Colin Thubron because, like southern Spain, it's been so subsumed by tourism. But I think his place, really, will be as somebody who, above all, charted that extraordinary change that was taking place, both in the popularity of Greece, it suddenly becomes discovered, and, of course, politically. Darrell himself recalled those years before Factor 15 and Club Med. Greece at that time was pretty backward and pretty wild. I think there were only about 20 tourists a year. And Cooks used to organise little groups of elderly gentlemen who looked like Edward Lear, who were millionaires, uh, English and American. But they came rather defensively to look at the monuments uh, and study them. But the mass tourism is a post-war phenomenon. <laughs> Oh dear, <laughs> Che Guevara beach towels, olive wood garden gnomes, ah, Mohican wind chimes and dream catchers and pornographic postcards. Mm -hmm. Darrell once said, you really do feel the seduction of Aphrodite in the spirit of place here. Well, if Aphrodite is here, she's probably speaking Swedish or Dutch. German, maybe even English. Narrow streets, t-shirts, Pokemon t-shirts, sun hats. The town must have changed so much since, since Durrell's day here. But if you do look above the tourist hat, it is easy to imagine him living and working and being inspired by this place. Somewhere between Calabria and Corfu, the blue really begins. He wrote of his coming to Corfu. All the way across Italy, you find yourself moving through a landscape severely domesticated, each valley laid out after the architect's pattern, brilliantly lighted, human. But once you strike out from the flat and desolate Calabrian mainland towards the sea, you are aware of a change in the heart of things, aware of the horizon beginning to stain at the rim of the world aware of islands coming out of the darkness to meet you. You enter Greece as one might enter a dark crystal. The form of things becomes irregular, refracted. Mirages suddenly swallow islands. And wherever you look, the trembling curtain of the atmosphere deceives. Other countries may offer you discoveries in manners or law or landscape. Greece offers you something harder the discovery of yourself. Did he discover himself here? 30 miles by road from buzzing Corfu town is Kalami. At the White House, where Durrell and his wife Nancy lived, I met writer Hilary Witten Pipetti, who has made a cottage industry of Durrell tourism. Yes, uh, Lawrence Durrell discovered himself here in Corfu in Kalami. Of course, this was where he started writing his major poetry and it was where he wrote his first major novel, The Black Book. It was here also that he wrote The Notebook, which, just a few pages, he set out for himself the whole of his future writing up until the Alexandria Quartet and the Avignon Quintet, and it was all there in that little notebook, what he was going to write for the rest of his life, and he wrote it right here at the White House. 
with this magnificent view, looking out over the what's called the Strait. What's this bit of water between? Um, this is the Corfu Channel between Corfu and Albania. Beautiful, beautiful hills beyond. And, and this is the White House. A White House set like a dice on a rock already venerable but with the scars of wind and water. But it has changed a little since he was here. Yes, I'm afraid that Larry wouldn't have looked out over those unfortunate puce-coloured villas on the other <laughs> side. Or the bodies on the beach, of course, and mm. the sun umbrellas and boats. It would have been just absolutely idyllic. And, of course, further down the coast, just a few minutes by the yacht, was the shrine of St Arsenius, which was uh, where Larry and Nancy would go swimming and, according to Prospero's cell, he would throw cherries into the water for Nancy to go in like an otter and bring them up to the surface. Wonderful image. So what was his working day like? Because in Prospero's cell, he gives us an idea that it's all very casual, just lying on the rocks all day and, and swimming, enjoying himself. But he must have worked very hard. Yes, he must have been sitting up there in the uh, top floor typing, because I remember someone said that they could always hear the clack, 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 clack of the, of the typewriter going. When Lawrence Darrow came to live in the White House, I was a little boy, and I used to fish around the place with, uh, with a cane. He used to ask me to uh, keep quiet while I was playing, so in order to keep me quiet, he used to just give me a biscuit. So later on, I would come back and make more noise so I can get another biscuit. He used to tell my father all the time that I eat a, a lot of biscuits. But when he was writing, he wanted his peace and quiet. Prospero's cell is a poetic diary of life on Corfu, Durrell's island of gold and moving blue that stains thoughts. It's no cheap and cheerful rough guide, telling tourists where to stay and what to see. Rather, it's an account of his assimilation of the culture through four years' residency. He plunged into a world of black cherries and salt water. He bought himself a boat rather than ride a ferry like this one. He learned to sail, to fish, to swim. He engaged his imagination. And this made him different. Colin Thubron again. He always talked about reaching the essence of, of something that um, even when he talked about landscape, he associated it with expressing the essence of a people. And I suspect that when he went away and looked back on the country he'd been in, he may have taken liberties with writing in order to reach that essence. As somebody said about the imagination, you know, it, it's not something that should soar away, it's something that should penetrate. Prospero's cell shows Durrell learning his craft, less as a storyteller and more as a young poet. It's often nostalgic, partly because he wrote it after he'd left Corfu and was in exile in Egypt during the war. It's a romantic evocation of Corfu conjured up in a fleet-footed imagination, according to Durrell himself. Prospero Cell, actually, I began in Alexandria. I think that in my second year in Alexandria, that's to say my fourth year in Egypt, I had six weeks leave and I felt the machine was getting so rusty. I hadn't written anything except poetry such a long time. I thought uh, I ought to take myself in hand and have a bash at uh, a bit more prose. And so I fudged up this imaginary diary based, of course, on old memories and so on of our life in Corfu pre-war. Cheeky, perhaps, but being here now, on the sea, under the sun, I can see this, that the imagined island in the book and Corfu itself are two different places. Similar, of course. The one having grown out of the other, but more than a ferry ride apart. This is the real island flavour. Our existence here in this delectable landscape, remote from the responsibilities of an active life in Europe, have given us this sense of detachment from the real world. Over the smoking copper pans, the face of Paul, the Cretan manager of the tavern, looms strangely. He watches over the dishes, pausing to wipe the sweat out of his great brown moustaches, his manner is that of one who has dealt with epicures for a lifetime. Later, Luke, the blind guitarist, arrives, led by his small son, a child of great beauty and pallor. Its face is the face of a Byzantine icon. 
Stiffly, the old red-faced man sits down on a chair and strikes his instrument. The small expressionless face of the boy is cocked over his cheap violin as he tunes it. Then they strike up one of the familiar Greek jazz songs. <laughs> I think what Durrell did was allow himself to be quite subjective about the way he treated writing about an island, and that has allowed other people to be subjective. After the war in Egypt, Durrell island hopped to Rhodes, liberated both in heart and mind, as Islamanian author Lucy Irvin relates. Certainly, he's been a very freeing influence on somebody like myself who perhaps you know might have been very intimidated by you know the, the sort of previous uh, travel books that we've had marvelous though they are they are not the writer and the poet speaking so much and suddenly we have Darrell both prose writer and poet undoubtedly poet and it comes through to me incredibly well on roads the poet in him the inventor plunged into the deep end and gave his imagination free reign. I don't know uh, how widely known it is, but one of the main characters, one of the most attractive characters in Reflections is Gideon, this chap uh, with a monocle with whom Durrell supposedly travels all the way from Alexandria on a boat, and they're literally thrown together on the boat. And also, Gideon has a little dog named what? Homer. <laughs> um, <laughs> so here we have Durrell being shamelessly inventive and he uses Gideon with great skill. There are people, Gideon used to say by way of explanation, who find islands somehow irresistible. The mere knowledge that they are on an island, a little world surrounded by the sea, fills them with an indescribable intoxication. These born Islamanes, he used to add, are the direct descendants of the Atlanteans and it is towards the lost Atlantis that their subconscious yearns throughout their island life. I forget the other details, but like all Gideon's theories, it was an ingenious one. Rather than get out of my depth in whimsical waters, I'm coming ashore to seek out someone who knew Durrell, John Leatham, a writer and translator who was well acquainted with him on Rhodes. My own view about Gideon is that he was nobody in reality. I think that uh, Larry created Gideon as a medium for telling certain things. But at the same time, uh, his own substance, as it were, passed into the substance of Gideon. I think Gideon was composite. He was part fiction, part self-portrait. <laughs> In Reflections on a Marine Venus, the second book of the Island Trilogy, Durrell didn't simply portray paradise, he enhanced it. In what appears to be a non-fiction book, Gideon, his one-eyed, monocled invention, is an inspired device, allowing Durrell to engage the reader through character and dialogue. Here, he and Gideon dive into the Aegean water, clear and cold as wine. Their days drop as softly as fruit from trees, they disagree on facts. Durrell made a mercurial shift from facts as he saw them to what he called reality prime, moving, in his words, from truth to the essence of truth. The two years on Rhodes were the happiest time of his life, both in reality and in his writing, as John Leatham recalls. For Larry, Rhodes was always an idyll in his life. It was even an idyll at that time, and I think he saw it at that. But later on, reflecting on the past, it was always Rhodes that seemed to him to be the happiest years of his life. He was always gathering information for something he was one day going to write, whether it was going to be encapsulated in a poem or perhaps uh, written into a book. Writing always, I think, was an escape route for him. And uh, he drew on the past, he drew on his experiences. Sometimes one got the impression that Larry was rather a, a man who had never grown out of boyhood or being a schoolboy, and yet he had this extraordinary intellect. The two things were rather in conflict with each other, but he could give that impression. I was very much a junior player, rather like a long stop. 
but occasionally I was part of the team, usually through a night-long session. Conversation flowed, banter was part of the order of the day, poems were read when um, we all gathered together. Anonymous Hand record one afternoon in May, sometime before the fig leaf. Boats lying idle in the sky, a town thrown as on a screen of watered silk, lying on its side, reddish and soluble, a sheet of glass leading down into the sea. Down here an idle boy catches a cicada, imprisons it laughing in his sister's cloak, in whose warm folds the silly creature sings. Shape of boats, body of a young girl, cicada, conspire and join each other here in twelve sad lines against the dark. Like Durrell and his Gideon, Lucy Irvin shares a passion for the sea and for swimming at night. Between Trianda and Mixie, the road reaches the sea for the first time, and here the beaches have been swept by the moon until the floor of pebbles and sand glitters as if it were slippery with the mucus of frog spawn. It is warm, and there's not a soul about. In a moment, I've shed my clothes, and I'm swimming out across the golden bars of moonlight, feeling the soft, foamy commotion of water drumming on my sides, the peerless warmth of that summer sea. I swim for a moment or two, and then turn on my back to watch the sky through wet eyelashes, and lying there, arms behind my head, on that resilient, tideless meadow of water, I see in my mind's eye the whole panorama of our Rhodian life made up of a thousand different scenes and ages, all turning before me now as if on the slow turntable of the Four Seasons. His output was immense, and I think it's added hugely, not only to our literature, but to the approach that writers take to travel writing and to fiction writing as well. Of course, he worked a lot and corresponded a lot with Miller and Anais Nin and all these people who were breaking moulds all the time. You know, they, they were overstepping boundaries, and we haven't looked back. Time was that travel books were all about travelling. Travel writers embarked on valiant quests full of daring do, paddling to the source of the Limpopo in search of original knowledge. Then the world shrank, with day trippers trampling the wilderness and Judith Chalmers making the foreign familiar. Durrell's island books mark the turning point between Dr Livingston and Bruce Chatwin when travel writing was becoming less about physical journeys. Durrell wasn't the first to step over the boundary into the realm of invention. Earlier travellers from Marco Polo to Robert Byron had taken liberties with their material, but he was the first poet and novelist to make original, subjective journeys in the discovered world. Then my thoughts turned to complete the greater arc of this small green island. Any effort, and... Uh, that too, I think, he associates it with a very old Greek world. This is the old Greek genius coming out, and so you are enjoying, if you like, the kind of tone of voice and way of speaking of a world that might have been 2,500 years old as far as Dull is concerned. The reality is that time has changed Greece and the Greeks, as Durrell himself once admitted, and challenged at the same time. For example, there can't be a single Greek left, a real Greek uh, genetically, uh, biologically, left in Greece since ancient times because the place has been overrun a multifarious number of times. And yet you can't stand, for example, in the placo in Athens and not listen to the conversations and, and, uh, and have a plate full of Aristophanes. I mean, it just isn't changed by an iota. So there is a kind of consistent thing which doesn't seem to me genetically determined in the sense that the, the place has been overrun, resettled by Tartars, Mongols, this, that and the other, and yet there is something that is remain continuously Greek, continuously olive-bearing. I mean, I'm sure that you know, modern historians are always going to point out that the Greek world has been so diluted by invasion that to what extent the modern Greeks are ethnically 
like, say, the Greeks of Pericles and Athens, is very hard to deduce. Cyprus, in particular, is not at all like even mainland Greece. There are many other ethnic infusions which have taken place there, which makes the Cypriots different. He does acknowledge that. He says that these people have traditionally been thought of as more docile, for one thing, and with less of that hyperactive energy than the more mainland Greek would have. In 1953, Durrell cast himself onto his third Paradise Island to produce his last and finest island book. He called the book Bitter Lemons, and in it, Cyprus stands on the brink of civil war. Here, Durrell set down his life in fact and poetic fiction, working as a press officer for the British government, buying a house, embroidering the comic road called Sabri Tahir, and unpicking the oncoming partition. His island idyll was about to be lost again. So he wrote of reordering reality, of seeking the meaning of the pattern in our common actions, of finding through writing, quote, the joyous compromise with all that wounds and defeats us in life. On Cyprus, the Greek cycle was completed. He had arrived on Corfu as a poetic diarist and would leave here as an assured, self-sufficient storyteller who no longer needed real islands. And he seemed to me one of those people you have no difficulty in being friends with from the very start. No sort of artificiality, no barriers. And this is rather unusual in people, particularly when you meet them when they're horizontal. The poet Penelope Tremaine, who was working with the Red Cross, remembers meeting Durrell on the beach at Kyrenia. It was a dangerous time to be British on Cyprus, as she soon found out, living in his house in the mountain village of Bella Pay, above the ruined abbey. Out of the main square, one of these little wobbly lanes went more or less straight up into the mountainside. This lane, you couldn't get a car up, you could just get a donkey up. With the two panniers, if they'd been very carefully loaded, and then the house itself, very neatly built. One of these great big carved wooden doors painted that fairly deep Mediterranean sea blue. The most attractive sort of doll's house, enlarged to be big enough for people. But it, was, it had the drawback that it was rather dark. It had only one window. And he'd left in it a copy he'd bought of one of the statues in the museum. Half size, not life size. Of, I don't know who it was, but it always looked to me, I used to laugh about it with him, it looked to me like a Byzantine civil servant. And the first time that they thought they'd better get rid of me, they sent two young men up to see if they could pop me off through the window. Not having used the joint beforehand, they found themselves face to face with the Byzantine civil servant. <laughs> and I was told later they ran down to the square again and told their superiors, we can't do the job, there's a soldier on duty inside. <laughs> Penelope stayed on in the village when Durrell felt it was time for him to leave. Everybody had to... Uh, travel from Nicosia by the airport bus uh, in, for obvious anti-terrorist reasons. And I was seeing Larry off into the bus. And he'd uh, made all the arrangements you when know, he gave, handed the keys over uh, to the Bella Pais house and got into... <laughs> of course, it was unlicensed. <laughs> Cyprus lies in the crook of the Mediterranean between three continents. It's been coveted for 4,000 years, first by Mycenaeans, who were dislodged by Hittites, by Persians, kicked out by the Romans, then by Byzantium, Crusaders, Venetians, Ottomans, and the British. Under the British, the Orthodox Greeks coexisted with the Muslim Turks. But during Durrell's two year stay, the island slid towards partition because of nationalism, intolerance, and intransigence on both sides. 
Tourism has deepened that divide by enriching the Greek South with the Turkish North embargoed. Not far from Belapes, in what is now northern Turkish Cyprus, is the hill village of Lapta, formerly Lapithos. In amongst the village houses, yellow beach umbrellas surround a swimming pool, built in a churchyard, the church transformed into holiday apartments. Many Orthodox chapels, like this one, have been stripped of their icons, their frescoes hacked off the walls and sold on the international art market. After a few weeks, Kyrenia, for all the formalised beauty of its ravishing harbour, its little streets and walled gardens rosy with pomegranates, began to pall. So what has changed Greece more? Stuka bombing raids on Athens? The Turkish invasion of Cyprus? Or the northern European sun-seeker? Durrell writing in bitter lemons. It's difficult to analyse why. For the spring was on us, and the green fields about the village, still spotted with dancing yellow oranges and tangerines, were thick with a treasury of wild flowers such as not even spring in roads can show. But other considerations intruded, changing its atmosphere. The outskirts of the walls, where still the traces of ancient tombs were clear in the rock face of quarries or cutting, had begun to bristle with cheap little villas and tarmac roads on the pattern of Wimbledon. Here and there, houses already bore the alarming name signs which greet one from the gates of seaside boarding houses, Morha Pool, Chowringi, the Gables. The little place was obviously soon to become one of those forlorn and featureless townships hovering on the outskirts of English provincial cities, suburbs without a capital to cling to. Its real life as a Greco-Turkish port of the Levant was ebbing out of it. Or so one felt. Disturbing anomalies met the eye everywhere. A Cypriot version of the small car owner, for example, smoking a pipe and reverently polishing a Morris Minor. Costumed peasants buying tinned food and frozen meat at the local version of the co-op. Ice cream parlours with none of the elaborate confectionery, the true Levant delicacies, which make the towns of the Middle East as memorable as a tale from the Arabian night. An almost total absence of good food or any fishy delicacy. The peasant was already becoming a quaint relic of a forgotten mode of life. White bread and white collars. Lucy Irvin, too, was taken by surprise by the rapid advance, the invasion of tourists. Quite amusingly, when I was 16, I, rather romantically, I suppose, decided it would be nice to sleep out on the Acropolis in Athens. And up there I went with my sleeping bag and settled down for the night. And it was beautiful, sun setting, moon coming up, stars later, silence. And I must have drifted off to sleep. Very suddenly, I was awoken to a sonne lumiere. I was lit up in my sleeping bag. And there we have, you know, grease packaged for the tourist. Times have changed. John Leatham, a long-time resident of Athens, witnessed those changes firsthand. In Durrell's day, I'd say those who could travel were travellers and not tourists, still. Tourism in Greece probably didn't take off until the mid-60s. Very small beginnings. I can't remember when the first million tourists in any one year reached Greece, but it certainly wouldn't have been I'd have thought till the late 70s. Now, I don't know what the hideous figures are, uh, possibly 12 million. I don't know what it is. I've seen a figure, but that may be false. What I can tell you is that it has not only changed Greece, and its physical appearance, it has changed the outlook of the Greeks. Uh, because tourism is money. And tourism has become the mainstay of very many Greeks. They derive their yearly income from four months, five months of intensive tourist activity. And uh, they have to make concessions to the expectations of the tourists. And most tourists are ignorant before they've been to Greece for several times of what they can enjoy on a purely Greek level. And Durrell saw more than just tourism changing the outlook of the Greeks. The new invasion of the Goths is coming from us. When I say us, 
I mean, everybody, uh, you know, um, the so-called highly developed cultures are spreading their poisons now. We have now two supermarkets and they're now settling for tin food because they can't find any other. And for, for convenient food, I can't say anything against it. It's eatable, it's not poison, it's pasteurized. But, uh, of course, once you assail a nation in its taste buds, why, the whole of their culture is called into question. You see, too many people standing on each other's faces, tourism, buses, lorries, and gigantic millions and millions of acres of concrete. The whole thing has been snowed under with abominable architecture. Ferro-concrete, Jerry building, the worst kind. So as we've collected our air miles, what have the Greeks lost? I asked Babis Tsoukalas, who returned home to these islands after 17 years in Australia. With food, for example, a lot of things to do with food are olive oil. It's something that's slowly disappearing. I mean, uh, people now just... It's not economical now to... Uh, who is going to actually go out there to just pick up olives when they can make all this money? Just open a taverna and you can make all this money. Why do you want to worry about the olives? So what's happening now? They leave the olives. And what, is, what they do is they just cut them up and they send them to Italy for, to make coal. And then they buy it back so they can use it as a grill bar. We lived on this all our lives. I mean, we have a very long history here. And, uh, I mean, the recorded history is since 720 BC. And they used to have olive oil back then. Homer refers to olive oil as liquid cold. For 2,700 years, we managed to keep it. And then all of a sudden, because of 30 years of tourism, we've lost it. Patrick Lee Fermer, in the introduction to Rumeli, used the phrase that all the traditions of Greece were being smashed between the butt of a Coca-Cola bottle and the Iron Curtain. The Greeks have a saying, and that is that everything flows. Nothing is static. The rapidity of the flow is very great today. It used not to be in the past. And what of Cyprus, Durrell's last island? Penelope Tremaine again. They've lost one enormous thing that nobody ever talks about. They had an opportunity to become an island of their own, to become Cypriots. It's the only chance in all their history they've ever had, and they've lost it. There isn't a hope now. I don't think the Turkish Cypriots ever realised that it could. The Greek Cypriots did, and they know what they've thrown away. the biggest example I've ever watched personally of poetic justice as the ancient Greeks meant it. Both sides have got exactly what they asked for and it's ruined them both. I walked down to the harbour where the still water was full of frozen lamplight from the houses round about it under a black rubber, star-cancelled sky. It was very peaceful, yet all around us in the darkness now, the island was slowly erupting in little spots of heat. The operational lines at the office would be scratching out their messages. A bomb at the cinema in Larnaca. Two men killed in a coffee house. A bomb at a car park in Paphos. A sentry murdered in Famagusta. Infinitesimally small flashes of hate, like the spark of single matches struck here and there in the darkness of a field, none strong enough to ignite the whole, thank God, yet there, ever present, as a reminder of the sullen weight of the people's wish. My footsteps echoed softly upon the sea wall. I was, I realised, very tired after this two years spell as a servant of the crown. And I had achieved nothing. It was good to be leaving. Journeys, like artists, are born and not made. 
A thousand differing circumstances contribute to them, few of them willed or determined by the will, whatever we may think. They flower spontaneously out of the demands of our natures, and the best of them lead us not only outwards in space, but inwards as well. Travel can be one of the most rewarding forms of introspection. In our discovered world, where Chatwin's Patagonia is now a holiday home for the Benettons, what is the value of travel writers? And what is Durrell's contribution and his legacy? Colin Thuber on first. I think the journeys are going to increasingly be um, inner, um, or they are going to be journeys that are looking beneath the superficial similarities in countries and cultures. The world around us is constantly changing, and just as you have to retranslate for each generation the Odyssey or whatever, you need to retranslate the world. So even to go to Provence or something, that has changed with each generation, and that too needs some sort of reportage, some sort of document. Not only that, but the priorities and sensibilities of each generation of travel writers in the host country have changed too. And so people of a generation or two younger than me have different priorities and, and different obsessions, perhaps, than my generation had, just as mine were different from those before. So, in a way, it's two cultures looking at one another, and both are changing, and I think that's the value. Not that the travel writer is discovering something new. He's investigating something old and seeing what's changed in it. And as to the question of factual truth or invention, does it matter in Durrell's non-fiction island books? There's a sort of economy, perhaps, about what he's trying to do, and you get that feeling that things have probably been collapsed together, have been condensed rather than really embellished in order to express something more economically and tightly than they would have been if you'd had 